Welcome to the WordPress Photography Podcast, the podcast for photographers who want to learn how to get the most out of WordPress to grow their photography business. You don't need to be a geek to understand WordPress. Settle back and listen as we show you how. Now, here's your host, Scott wyden Kivowitz. Welcome to episode 14. My name is Scott wyden Kivowitz, and I'm joined by my co-host, Rachel, from Photoscribe. Hey, Rachel. Hey, Scott. How are you? Good. How you doing? Good. Just a uh, rainy day here in Boston. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here in New Jersey too. It's uh, it's it's like it's been a week of this. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, we needed rain, but I don't know if we needed this much rain. <laughs> no, I don't so, think anyone needs this much rain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. So, uh, I think we're actually pretty caught up as far as um recording goes from when the episodes go live. We're now about a week behind when each episode goes live. That's pretty good. Um, and it takes a few days to go through the, you know, auditing edits, uh, audio edits, the video edits, the transcription. So um, it's kind of nice, uh, actually, to be closer to publish date now, where we're usually about three weeks um, ahead of the game. So Yeah. Yeah, when we started, we were definitely a couple, almost even a month behind yeah. from our when we recorded the episodes to when they went live, and now we're really on this every other Thursday schedule, and it's been really great, you know, with the scheduling and getting guests on, and then getting it to go live pretty quickly afterwards. Yeah, yeah, totally. So it's, it feels feels good. Um, today we have Aaron Hockley on the show. I'm very excited. Uh, yes. I've known Aaron for many years online. We've never met in person <laughs> yet. Um, one day it'll happen. Um, but uh, Aaron Hockley has a background in both technology and photography, which puts him in an ideal position to work on a variety of projects, bridging the gap between those two worlds. He's worked as a professional event and small business photographer in Portland, Oregon, for uh, over for eight years. Um, he's been involved in the WordPress world since founding World Camp, World Camp, World Camp Portland in 2008 having spoken at numerous WordCamps, uh, WordCamp events since that time. Uh, Aaron currently publishes Photo Webo, or is it Weibo? It's Webo. Webo, okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> As a site devoted to the intersection of photography and the internet, offering a, vo a variety of resources for photographers who are looking to improve their online presence. He recently worked with the WordPress core team to refine some image-related changes, which we've talked about uh, in WordPress 4.5, uh, image changes that, uh, if you go back and listen, we won't get into it again, but if you listen to episode 12 and 13, we've talked about it multiple times. Um, yeah. uh, so, welcome to the show, Aaron. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for having me here today. I'm glad to glad to chat with you. And like you said, we've never met in person, but we keep crossing paths in the virtual world. So it's uh, I'm sure we'll have some good stuff to discuss. Yeah, and you've met uh, uh, Imagely founder Eric, I think, once or twice at this point? Right? A couple times now. Yeah. I've met him a couple times. I've met uh, Edward uh, from your support yeah. team a couple times as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, just you and I haven't ended up in the same location at the same time yet. Yeah. I'm sure it'll happen here so pretty soon. Yeah. yeah, I feel like the WordPress slash photography intersection world is pretty small, so... <laughs> totally. We're all going to get together at one place someday, I'm sure. Yeah, right, sure. The trick is the the virtual nature of it, and that we're all distributed. You know, both of you yeah. are on the in the east coast and the northeast, and I'm on the far west coast, and Eric is kind of in the middle. And yeah, uh, <laughs> yep. so. yeah, it's it's really funny how that works. Um, so before we uh, get into anything with you, let's first just dive into two pieces of news. Um, the first, uh, I'll say the first one is WordPress 4.5.1 is now out with 12 bug fixes. Related to some issues that were um, that came with WordPress 4.5 and some other things, um, so it's a minor release, but it's an important release because it fixes some bugs that you might have um, in your WordPress updates. So run your backups and update to WordPress 4.5.1. Yes. Um, as soon as possible. Definitely do that because there was a big issue with Jetpack with 4.5, yep. and they fixed that rather quickly, which was great. Um, but yeah, make sure you're up 4.5.1. Yes. <laughs> Um, the other bit of news is Yoast SEO, which is probably the most talked about plugin on this show. Yeah, for <laughs> um, sure. Yeah, uh, it uh, 3.2 came out. Um, now it's already, I think, a couple minor point releases since then. But 
where uh, 3.2 came out, and one of the biggest changes was they removed the Google Plus features from its social features. Um, so here is the blurb. They called it Google Minus. Uh, this is the blurb in their changes. <laughs> Call Google Minus. We removed the uh, we removed the Google Plus functionality from the plugin. Google is slowly depreciating the network. On top of that, its metadata was was giving conflicts with Facebook, which caused lots of issues. As Google Plus uses Facebook metadata, optimizing for Facebook should do what uh, what you need for Google Plus too. Basically, they're saying uh, we don't know what Google is doing. So we're going to stop playing around and trying to make it work and just give up on Google+, because who knows what's going to happen to it. Um, I, I, I kind of agree with it. Google+, Plus hasn't been what it used to be when it first started. It's been uh, changing, shifting direction. It's been going downhill, and um, I'm seeing more spam there than I do anywhere else at this point. So, um, yeah. So if you have Yoast SEO installed and you've updated it, don't be surprised if you're... Google Plus options are removed. All right. Um, that's the news. <laughs> that's the news. All right. So, um, Aaron, what's going on in your world? What's going on in my world? Well, uh, it's been kind of interesting. Um, on uh, on PhotoWebo, the last big article I published was the article about the image changes in 4.5. Um, and I don't know what your world is like as far as your job of, you know, content creation and things like that, but I find um, I tend to go through streaks where it's either uh, feast or famine as far as my time and availability allows. Um, and I've had some ideas for articles I need to get up there, but I haven't published anything in the last couple of weeks. I've been busy with some other projects. Uh, last week I taught a all-day workshop on SEO for photographers. Uh, to the uh, Oregon Professional Photographers Association, and uh, that was interesting. It's, uh, I think SEO is one of those things that, you know, it's been a topic here on the show, I know, a few times in the past, but uh, it's an ongoing effort for everyone, and I think just as the search world evolves, um, I think it's interesting to see how photographers go about that, and Unfortunately, I think there's a lot of people taking old bad advice in the SEO world. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, and the other thing that's been interesting, and I I should write about this, is I think you know a lot of times photographers almost go about SEO backwards, and that they they figure out their content, and then later they think about, well, how can I approach that from an right. SEO perspective? Yep. yep. Yeah. Rather than. Uh, you know, rather than looking at what might be their search engine goals and then writing content that fits that. So, you know, having having uh, uh, taught many different SEO workshops, classes, and having I'm going to be speaking at Canada Photo Convention in October about SEO as well. Um, I know, and I know I'm sure you saw this when you did an all-day class on it, but SEO is one of those topics that people try to avoid. But then once they're learning about it, they get, like, sucked in and they want to know more and more. It's really interesting. Like, they go from, like, okay, am I actually going to learn anything here? And they're, like, you know, the body language, um, you see it right away. And then mm -hmm. once you start talking and they see how cool it can be and how, really how easy a lot of it is, um, they just, they want more. They they get sucked in. So, so well. Yeah, a lot of it is, you know, a lot of it is easy things to do. A lot of it is, um, you know, and figuring out how to prioritize things. I mean, I know at one point I talked a little bit during the workshop about how your site speed and performance, you know, is mm -hmm. an SEO factor, and that's something you should consider. Um, and I gave folks a couple of resources to look at, such as the the Google uh, Page Speed Insights or the the Y Slow tool that you can use to analyze your site. Um, and people really, you know, got into their laptops and started looking at their sites. It's, it was hard not to get off onto a side tangent where we then spent an hour just talking about performance. You know, it's. Um, but the other thing with SEO that, you know, is uh, is something that folks have to keep in mind is that you know. It, it's an ongoing effort. It's not something that you learn once or that you, you know, that you do once and you're done with it. Um, much like, uh, much like social media, right? You can't, you know, you can't decide. Okay, I'm going to go take a take a class, and next week I'm going to do social media, and then I'll be done with my social media for a while. It's yeah. like, well, no, it's, <laughs> it's a, it's an ongoing effort that you know you need to, you know, you need to be social, not do social, and. Okay. Uh, and the SEO work is the same way, where if, you know, yes, there's things that you can set up, you know, that are 
more or less one-time efforts when it comes to things like making sure you have a decent hosting and security and performance and things like that. But when it comes to your content, um, that just needs to become part of your content process on an ongoing basis is that you're always cognizant of the search factors when you write a blog post, when you record a video, when you, you know, publish to social media. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I ruined everybody's morning at the search workshop by telling them that unfortunately they were going to walk away and they were going to have a ton more work to do <laughs> than when they walked in the door. Yeah. But uh, yeah. uh, I think yeah. everybody I think everybody took it well. I've had a lot of positive feedback on the class, and so um, I know I always I, I'm always wary of SEO quote unquote experts that come to photographers hmm. because I think that. There's SEO for small businesses, and then there's SEO specific to photographers. And unless you are a photographer or live in that world and like understand image searching and image keywording, you know it's hard to sort of game the system. Um, that's why I always, you know, I'm always wary of people that come into the photography industry and say, "Oh, we're SEO experts," if they're not photographers like you guys are and, and understand the working nature of what it means to be a photographer and put out the content. And and that's actually what we do at Photoscribe is we help photographers blog on a regular and consistent basis because what I found is blogging at the same day and the same time gives you some of that organic SEO that um, you don't get by posting like here and there unless you know you're doing it on a really strict I mean some photographers have found success not blogging on a schedule but not many and I wonder if you have any thoughts of that about how the SEO sort of links into that yeah I think you know getting something out there on a somewhat consistent basis is important and you know one of the questions that often comes up is well you know how often do I need to post to my blog or um, you know that everybody talking about being too busy and you know usually what I tell them is you know being consistent is more important than being frequent yep. <laughs> um, and that it would be better to post you know once a week than to post you know five days one week and then not post anything again for a right. month. Right yeah um, that's what we tell yep. And uh, you know, and so, but I realize that's difficult. I mean, and, you know, I, I laughed, I mentioned, you know, it's been now, I think, you know, a couple of weeks since I published something new on PhotoWebo, which is, you know, that's rare to go that long. Um, you know, I should do a better job of having something scheduled or prepared that I could have put out there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it, the, the, I, the answer to that is stop being so damn busy. Right. right. You know, that's... Well, it's hard. When the busier you get, and the it is. And, you know, when you have more clients as a photographer or any small business, and then the things that get neglected are that content slash marketing slash SEO stuff. But then you know you lose clients, and you get back to the SEO, and then, then there's that lag time. So right. I, you know, um, over the years, like I used to blog um, uh, five days a week, and I would schedule it out a month. So I'd have literally a month, you know like 20, 30 articles um, with wow. photos all scheduled. So it's, I'm always like, I don't have to think about it for 30 days or whatever it is. Um, and then over time, I got busier and busier, and it went down to three days a week, then two days a week. And now I'm at one day a week. And sometimes I barely even make that one day. Um, this is on my personal site. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I totally get it when photographers say, I, I don't have time to blog. I can't be consistent. It's not easy when you're busy. Um, but it's important. I, I, yeah. I'll try to, even if it's a short article, it's something that search engines are going to see that there's something fresh, which in turn is going to help the entire site because there's movement. Yeah. Right. So, I, the, the public's perception of it can be interesting too. I had to laugh. I had lunch with a photographer a while back and we were chatting about marketing and social media and things like that. And uh, he made the comment that, you know, or I made a comment to him that I'd seen a lot of, you know, a lot of tweets and a lot of Facebook posts and things like that from him recently. He's like, yeah, the, my work has been dead. I can't get the phone to ring. I'm waiting for business to come in. Um, he's like, and you're not the first person to make that observation, which is that, you know, when, when the photographers, you know, many freelancers, you know, it seems to either be feast or famine. When you have that famine and you're waiting for the clients to come in, you have a lot of time to do the social media to do blog posts to write you know articles for the search engines things like that um, and it becomes a case of just kind of needing to budget your uh, you know budget your time much like you save up some money for a rainy day hopefully you can uh, 
you know, when you have that time where you have the ability to create a bunch of content that you can bank some of that, that you can then trickle out there, um, you know, so when you do get busy that you can still put something out there uh, to look like you're, you're still marketing. Right, so. right. And, I mean, since this is the WordPress podcast, we should right. probably talk about how WordPress <laughs> right. is 90% optimized out of the box. I mean, Scott and I have been having a lot of discussions, and our whole episode 13 was devoted to Squarespace versus right. WordPress. And, you know, if you are optimizing for SEO, being on WordPress gets you so much closer just by being on WordPress. Do you right. have any thoughts on that? And what do you tell people about WordPress versus Squarespace, for your opinion? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Before this workshop, the workshop had, uh, I think we had 11 people in my workshop. Um, and prior to that, I sent an email to all the attendees, and I asked them what platform they were using because I wanted to get a feel for what technologies were in play. Uh, and about half of them were using WordPress. Um, there were a couple people on Squarespace. Uh, there were a couple of people using Big Folio. Um, there was somebody using something that's completely homegrown and hand-coded that she has a, somebody that she just pays to maintain her site for her. Um, but one of the th things that became clear as we got into talking about the technical SEO aspects is that WordPress, both with what's available as part of core WordPress and what's easily and freely available through things like, you know, the Yoast SEO plugin that gets brought up every single week on this yeah. podcast. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, yeah. And, and some, other, uh, some other options is that when it comes to a technical SEO perspective is that, you know, between WordPress itself and some free plugins is you're 99% of the way there for zero cost and for, you know, a pretty easy learning curve on most of that stuff. Yep. Um, whereas if you're on a closed platform where you don't have that flexibility, you might have some options that they choose to give you. Um, but if you have something like a Squarespace or a Big Folio or something like that, is that at some point you will hit limitations. And where I can say, yeah, you just go into the Yoast plugin and you fill out this one field, that may not even be possible on another platform. And so really, you know, uh, WordPress really is the best toolkit out there from that perspective right now for, you know, for photographers or for any small business. I mean, if you're not going to have a staff to do this for you, <laughs> which, you know, most of us don't, right. <laughs> um, you know, the more that you can do on your own with, uh, you know, with a relatively easy learning curve. I mean, I, you know, the the red, yellow, green traffic light on your content analysis with Yoast is, you know, yeah. you know, it's it's a beautiful thing because that's yeah. very easy for somebody to understand. Hey, yeah. I, I'm up at a yellow light. What do I need to do to get to a green light? Right. Um, and, and it tells you. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, and that's the thing yeah. is it gives you that formula. It says, hey, yeah. this article's a little short or you need to include yeah. some images or yeah. whatever. So, and if you don't know what we're talking about, you do need to install Yoast on your WordPress website and see. there. It actually will give you this red, it's this little teeny stoplight in the published panel and it's red, yellow, green. Red is bad SEO, yellow is okay SEO, green is you're good to go. Um, I have noticed recently that the newest updates of Yoast actually, it's a little bit easier to go green. I don't know if you guys have had the same experience. Um, I blog mm -hmm. on a lot of different photographer blogs, so I have my hands in a lot of different markets and a lot of different keywords. And it used to be a little bit harder to make the Yoast SEO go green, like your um, your meta description had to be perfectly on point and your images had to be perfectly on point in terms of keywording. And now they sort of, it's like if you have the best two out of three, it'll go green. So hmm. I don't know if that's just, again, the changing nature of SEO, but it, mm -hmm. it's a little bit easier to get it to where you need it to be is what I found. It's Well, my guess is it's, it's like maybe two or three possible answers for that. One being um, SEO algorithms do change and Yoast is on top of it, so it's very possible that they have adjusted the algorithm um, and there was a major update to that, um, the page analysis system, so it is possible there wasn't a change to their algorithm yeah. uh, that determines the quality. The other might be that you're just getting better. <laughs> yeah, I'm just so. that good. <laughs> well, I do notice well. that um, things like if you did... Uh, wedding photographer in, let's say, Portland, Oregon, um, that, that in used to be a stop word. 
and what I've found now in Yoast is that they're not necessarily counting stop words as much because we're all sort of going for the long tail keywords, which if you don't know what a long tail keyword is, instead of just being like Boston wedding photographer, you're doing the Liberty Hotel wedding photography. So you're using more words to make a long tail keyword. Right, guys? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, and that's um, one of the things that you kind of brought up, or, or Scott hinted that you've done it so much you're getting better at it. Part of it is just building up that habit, right? Yeah. I mean, as you mm -hmm. get used to making sure you include appropriate, you know, alt tags with your images yep. or to include, you know, uh, file names that are SEO optimized or to include these different things is that it becomes habit and you don't need the tool to remind you every time, which is great. The other thing and the biggest thing that I find photographers struggle with is writing long enough content. Mm -hmm. right? yep. I mean, we, you know, regardless of whatever your genre of photography is, you know, you know, we're photographers, not writers. And so we want to throw up, you know, <laughs> here's, you know, five images of, you know, this event that I photographed, or here's, you know, 20 images from this wedding, or here's, you know, these senior photos that I did in this park, and here's the, you know, six different poses we did, um, you know, and then you end up with, you know, 42 words in your blog post, right. <laughs> yeah. which doesn't give Google or Bing or any of the search engines a lot to work with. Um, and the so, other thing, you yeah, know, sure. the longer that you can go, you know, the m more likelihood you have that you can create something that's, you know, that's just an incredible resource. Um, right. And so that's, you know, kind of the other aspect is instead of the routine blog post, um, you know, it, instead of putting up, you know, a, a mediocre or an average blog post, you know, once a week, what if you did it twice a month, but they were great. Right, you know? exactly, and yeah. That, that, that better, more in-depth content that especially if you can provide something that's really useful for your target audience, whether it's a bride planning a wedding, whether it's a, you know, somebody at a corporation who's looking to have a bunch of, you know, executive portraits done of, you know, 15 people, whatever it is, if you can provide them something useful, that's going to be far more valuable both for them and from a search perspective because if it's useful, it's going to get noticed, right. it's going to get shared, it's going to get passed around. Um, that's going to be better than just, here's my latest shoot. So. Well, so I, I agree with that, um, but I also, a lot of the, the conversation that I have with photographers when they're blogging, consistency is key, which we've talked about, have the mm -hmm. Yoast SEO, which we've talked about, but also, what is the one thing that's different from shoot to shoot? And it's usually the client's story and then your story as a photographer at that moment. So for, for families and weddings and maternities and, and a lot of the portrait and wedding photography industry, there's an inherent story that you can blog about. And part of that is capturing the, um, the information from your clients. So while those marketing type blogs, the, sort of what you mentioned about like um, what's the best way to shoot a, a headshot session, you can do those once a month or once every couple months, mm -hmm. but when you intersperse them in with the blog post of your shoots and include the client story, you're actually creating something that your client can then share, so then it becomes a resource to that group of people that your client's sharing it with and to your potential clients. So, there's so much content that we as photographers have. It's just how do you, you know, share it and market it, and then again do it consistently, like we've said a thousand times. You know, right? That that mix is really important. Yeah, um, it's you know, hard. I, it's really hard to sort of get there. You know. <laughs> um, you know, what I'd like to to talk about because I just ran to something that was interesting. That um, so at today, an article I wrote at Photography Spark went live and. It's a 3,000-word article. I haven't written a 3,000-word article in so long. It's um, hard. It, it, it's an e-book, literally. Right, right. It's an e-book, right? <laughs> so um, I wrote that. It took me one full business day to write that article. And um, there's been some personal stuff going on in my life that um, I blogged about on my own personal site. So anybody who's really curious, just check it out. But um, basically, my mind hasn't been in the clearest place for me to to really write a 3,000 word article so um, I was having really I was really struggling usually when I write content I close my office door um, I'll put on noise canceling headphones if there's stuff going on in the house because I work from home 
Um, I won't have music on or anything. I'll just silence and I'll write. Um, I'll close everything on the computer and I'll just write. It wasn't working. Um, I tried opening up um, downcasts and listening to some of my podcasts. wasn't helping. Um, I tried music. wasn't helping. So I opened up um, movies, and I, I actually watched Deadpool, right? <laughs> I, I wanted to watch something that I, I wasn't really watching. I was like, you know, my, the, the article I was writing is on one screen, and Deadpool was playing on the other screen. So I was sort of seeing it from, you know, peripheral and listening to it, and it actually helped me write better. That's I wrote a 3,000-word article in a day. It took me a while, but I wrote it, and it came out so awesome that there was very little editing to be done. It, it's now published. Um, so sometimes you need to, um, if you're having trouble blogging or writing any content for, any of, uh, for anything for your site, um, try something different to get you in a, in your, 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 your mind in a creative place I was listen, li literally watching in peripheral and listening to something that had good cinematography, um, good choreography, and awesome, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, an awesome script. It was just so funny, and it worked. So sometimes you just need that. Yeah, that's, and to put that in context, 3,000 words is a lot. So right. uh, Google recommends 300 words for a blog post yep. to be optimized, and that's like two paragraphs, which still can be really difficult as a photographer, as a visual person. Um, but that, that's a long blog post. So that's good that that, that worked for you. Yep. And the article is all about photography websites and themes. Yes, so. it'll be in the show notes. You should go <laughs> check it out. <laughs> but getting back to Aaron, so um, I, I see that you helped start the WordCamp in Portland. Right. Um, so what I found, because I work on the WordCamps here in Boston and in Providence, Rhode Island, I find that there's a lot of overlap between WordPress community and photography community. Do you find that also? What has been your experience having feet in both camps, so to say? I'm finding, uh, I find there's a lot of overlap at this point between the photography community and almost any community now that everybody's a photographer, right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Yes, you go to a WordPress event, you know, a WordCamp or something like that, and there's, you know, you're certainly not going to be the only one with a good camera there, right? There's probably going to be people there with better cameras than you, even if you're a professional photographer, as we all know. Uh, but there's definitely an overlap there. Um, I mean, as we've discussed and, you know, as you guys all know, I mean, WordPress is great for photographers, um, for any number of reasons. Uh, when it comes to the community aspect, which is really kind of how I got, um, you know, my, my background and what I went to college for is actually uh, computer science and software development. And so that's my, my professional background is technical. And so I, I started blogging back in like 2001 and then I started using WordPress, I think in 2004. Um, but I didn't really come into it from a technical angle like a lot of people do. Um, a lot of software developers and you know, plugin developers, theme developers. I came into it more from a community angle and that I was using blogging to publish um, and then got involved from a community side of things with other people using WordPress to publish. Um, and we started WordCamp Portland. Um, I remember distinctly how it, the genesis of it, there were uh, four of us sitting at um, a brew pub here in Portland called the Green Dragon, and we were sitting around one night, and if I recall, the second WordCamp San Francisco was happening the next day. Um, and it's like, oh, WordCamp San Francisco is happening. At some point in the discussion, it's like, you know, we ought to have a WordCamp in Portland. And somehow I ended up in charge of that. I don't, <laughs> you know, that, I remember, that, you know, the other three people that were there all ended up part of, you know, the organizing team that first year. Um, but it's been interesting to see how that community has evolved because in 2008 when we had WordCamp Portland, we were something like the, I want to say maybe the 20th WordCamp to ever have happened, um, you know, and now... You know, probably there have been 20 of them already in 2016. Yeah, um, it's but, amazing you know, the difference. At, yeah. at that point, you know, you really were entirely on your own to come up with what your WordCamp was going to be. There was no central WordPress foundation that helped manage any of that. The only real support or infrastructure that you got was you 
sent an email to Matt Mullenweg's personal assistant and said, hey, we're going to do a WordCamp in Portland. Um, and she basically wrote back to me and said, great, let me know your date and I'll, I'll give you guys a link on the, the central page that talks about WordCamps. And we'll send you a uh, you know a bag full of stickers and buttons you can hand out for swag. Uh, that was it. We were entirely on our own. Other than that, um, it's been interesting to see how WordCamps have evolved to the point where now there's you know hundreds of them every year around the globe. Um, there's you know uh, WordCamp San Francisco became the big national WordCamp or international WordCamp here in the U.S. And now they're doing WordCamp U.S. Um, yep. For this will be the, sec the second year of that uh, in Philly, um, and who knows what year, what city will be in the following year. Or WordCamp Europe has grown to be huge, yep. um, but you know the community aspect of WordPress really is great in that you know there's so many people with so many different backgrounds that all come together to help each other out. Um, get better in different ways, whether it's uh, publishing, whether it's uh, plugin or theme development, whether it's e-commerce. Um, there really are so many resources out there, you know, many of them free, <laughs> um, that you can plug into. That I mean, that's another one of the advantages that WordPress has over, um, you know, another system like, yeah. you know, like a Squarespace or that. Is that you know, if you, you want to do e-commerce with Squarespace, well, you can you can view their online help pages or maybe email them for support. Um, but you can't go grab a beer at a meetup in your local town right. and talk through those issues. So, so you know, and a, a um, lot of photographers don't know about that, Scott, just before, but we should yeah. tell you, wherever you are in listening to this, even international, I mean, they have WordCamps, WordPress meetups. Um, yeah. If you really are stuck and you need help, there are meetups everywhere, everywhere, yeah. like doesn't matter where you live. Yeah, that, so that's exactly what I was going to say. Was um, So we'll, we'll link to, to where you can find um, meetups and WordCamps in your area, but uh, just so anybody listening who won't be going to the website, go to wordcamp.org. Yep. And you can find... Now there is a central place. Yep. And uh, go to wordpress.meetup.com, and it'll forward you to the WordPress um, meetup groups that are in, you know with a map and everything. So you can find them in your area either way. Yeah. Um, so I want to jump into um, something fun. Um, <laughs> I'm going to call this a lightning round, even though this isn't a game or anything. But um, Aaron, we're going to quiz you a little bit. Uh-oh. You ready for this? Okay. So I'm going to ask you three questions. All three are similar, but the genre of photography is different. Okay. okay? So if you are a wedding photographer, give me a sample title for an article that you would do for wet for wedding photographers to target their audience. Sample title for wedding photographers to target their audience. Okay. Well, if we were going, I mean, I guess it would depend on what the article about. But you know, one option might be uh, the seven things that you've forgotten to ask your potential wedding photographers. Nice. As a bride. As and, yeah. Yeah, and numbers do really well in articles. Right. Yes. The, se the seven things that brides forget to ask their wedding photographers. Nice. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Number two, a sample title for product photographers. Like, like you know, uh, somebody who's going to photograph right. this, this water bottle for the for Camelback. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> for product photographers. Huh? That's an interesting one. We don't hear a lot about product photography, but I they're know. out there as well. I've, yeah. I've done a little... I did a little bit of it myself for a small business client last year, um, and I really gained an appreciation for all that's involved with some of the lighting aspects. Of yeah. Photography is like, man, it was one of those things where, you know, I don't know that I made a lot of money on this deal because it took me far longer than I thought it would, but I gained a lot of experience that was really valuable. Yeah. Anyway, so sample blog title. Um, let's see. Product, product is difficult. Um, yeah. I would say I would maybe go along the lines of you know you know how you know you know <laughs> want to skip it yeah you well yeah I, I mean I'm kind of thinking you know maybe something like you know how you know how choosing the right product photographer um, you know you know will lead to a better catalog presentation for your you know, for your clients or something. I mean, I or or what about um, you know, uh, three burning questions you should ask your product photographer before yeah, that, hiring. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of yeah, that's a good one. I mean, in my 
in my mind, and with this title and with the last one, I mean, it almost it becomes about that differentiation factor, right? I mean, yeah. as we all know, there's millions of photographers out there. What sets you apart, and how can you, how do you, how do you convince your client that what sets you apart is valuable to them? Yep. That's and the do you think say. that I mean, is there an argument that product photographers and even commercial photographers don't need to blog the same way that wedding portrait, even landscape photographers do, because their clients or you're creating their content for them. Yeah, so so obviously with a product photographer, there may not be a story to tell, per se. Right. You right. could make one up and have some fun with it, but there may not actually be a story. Um, but this is definitely where those marketing-type blogs, the list-type blogs, yeah. and the, um, yeah. the differentiation-type blogs are much more applicable. Right. Yep. I mean, as an example, so I do... Um, I do special event photography other than weddings, so a lot of corporate events, conferences, trade shows, company meetings, launch parties, anything like that. Um, I have an idea for an article that I'm going to write. It's probably actually going to be the next article I publish on my own photography website. Um, it's just going to be talking about what happens after I'm done shooting your event. What what mm -hmm. all happens, you know, how do I process and deliver the photos to you? What are your options there? How quickly will you get them, you know, or... How am I going to deliver them all that? Because that's something that, you know, it's not something we talk about a lot, but it's something right. that can really make the client's life easier if they, A, know what's going to happen, and B, yeah. it works well for them. So. Yeah. Yep, totally. That's a good and one. And that's an evergreen piece because that's something that you can write this week, but you mm -hmm. could send to your clients a year from now and say, right, yeah. hey, I wrote this blog post. In case you're wondering what the process is, it's all outlined here, and it hasn't really changed much. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, what was your third question? You said I know. <laughs> Lightning round number three. Yeah. Sample title for real estate photographers. Sample title for real estate photographers. Um, how to, you know, decrease your listings time on market, you know, with these, you know, with these five photography shots that every listing should have or something. I mean, yeah, you know, that's a good how one. do you, you know, how do you sell that home quicker? Nice. That's a good one. Something cool. like that. Yeah, that was that was fun. We've never done a lightning round. Quote <laughs> no, we probably should have given right. it some yeah. warning, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was kind of that was, that was. I just had the idea while we while we were right. talking, so I had to throw it out there. Um, so the one question that I wanted to ask while we were talking about all the SEO stuff is, if someone was listening right now, and again we're putting you on the spot, so <laughs> what would your top three tips for photographers be to do for your website right now? Just so. One, especially since this is a WordPress podcast, one is you need to install Yoast SEO yep. and you need to read a little bit about how that works and start to understand that, you know, the traffic signal on your content. Um, and there's so many resources out there on the internet on how to do that, but that would yep. probably be number one. Number two, I would say make sure you have uh, solid, secure web hosting. Yep. Um, yes. Hosting where you know you have decent performance. Hosting where you have security. I mean, I'm a big fan of managed hosting of some form. Yeah. Uh, you know, Imagely provides that. Um, I've had good experiences with WP Engine in the past. There's other companies that uh, Pagely does great things. There's a lot of other good solid companies that provide that. Yeah. Um, but the managed hosting means you're going to pay a little bit more. But it's not ridiculous. I mean, in the grand scheme of running a photography business, even good, solid managed hosting, if you're paying $20 to $30 a month for what is essentially your storefront, that's right. still a great deal. Yeah. Um, they're going to manage that security for you with a lot of things beyond just installing a plug-in. Um, they're going to, you know, hopefully offer reliable performance, things like that. Uh, probably the other thing I would say, you know, top three things, so Yoast, uh, good solid hosting. Um, the other thing I would say is to think, you know, don't try to retrofit your SEO onto your content. Think of it as you're building the content. Um, you know, I kind of mentioned this early on, a lot of photographers seem to go about it backwards, right? So instead of writing an entire article and then figuring out, oh, what, what keywords should I have put in there or what, you know, what audience was I going for with that? Think about that as you're writing the article. Before you write the article, think about who am I writing this for and how might somebody eventually find this? Yeah. And that'll help you work in, you know, those terms that you might want to be found for organically into the article. Um, it'll help you with crafting that title, things like that. So Yeah, that's great. Thanks. So I have um, one more question that we sort of, Scott and I have been talking about and um, 
we, we sort of touched upon it, but you are obviously a, compo- a proponent of WordPress, mm-hmm. and you're in the photography space. Do you notice that a lot of photographers have separate websites and blog sites, and they don't seem to make the connection that this can all be hosted on WordPress? And why do you think that is? I think, yes, definitely. And in my workshop last week, um, like I said, of the 10 or 12 people that we had in the workshop, I think two or three of them had separate, you know, portfolio sites versus blogs or, you know, websites versus blogs. I think we got into that position um, because generally photographers set up a website, you know, if we go back five to eight to ten years, photographers got a website and then at some point later they figured out, oh, I also need a blog. Mm -hmm. Um, And because we were talking five to eight to ten years ago, we weren't all using real user-friendly content management systems. most people weren't anyway. I mean, WordPress existed, but it was by no means as easy to use as it is today. Um, You know, we're talking like WordPress 1.5 or something. (laughs) Um, And so they would have a website that they set up or that somebody set up for them or that was set up using a flash gallery. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And then when they needed a blog, it's like, well, okay, I'll start a blog over here with WordPress or I'll start a blog with Blogger or I'll start a blog with uh, Movable Type or TypePad. Yeah. Um, And so they just became these different things based on how they got set up. And then because they got set up separately, a lot of people just didn't even realize that they could be combined. They thought that a website and a blog were different things. Um, You know, we now know, you know, that a blog is really just kind of a website in a particular format. Um, But uh, at this point, when somebody is looking at, you know, kind of redeveloping their web presence or changing out their infrastructure, um, there's so many benefits to having one cohesive system, you know, even if, you know, even if you don't choose WordPress as that platform, you know, I mean, I think you should, but, you know, it makes sense to have, you know, all of your stuff together. It helps you be able to drive that search traffic to a single location. It helps you be able to link easier between the different parts of that, that web presence. It looks like one cohesive internet presence rather than being fragmented across, you know, a website and a blog that may or may not look the same, that may or may not you know, link well between each other. So, yeah. and I, mean, I think we, I think we got into this point basically from historical reasons. I think if somebody were starting completely from scratch now, I think, I would think, and my experience has been that most people see it as more intuitive that you know their blog is part of their website. Yeah. And they would right. do that together. Yep. You know, uh, going back to the cohesiveness. Um, so, a lot of photographers these days are also doing subdomains for let's say the blog or a subdomain for, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the gallery that they're trying to sell images, which is on a different platform or whatever. Right. Um, It's important for photographers to know that search engines are looking at those as separate websites. Yeah. So whatever SEO juice you get on your main site does not have any impact on the subdomains. And Um, vice versa, when you blog you know, consistently and you build up those SEO juice that may not necessarily go to your main, to main site. site. Correct. Now, when you say subdomain, Scott, why don't you explain yep. so, what that so is? Yep, so subdomain, um, your domain is, uh, you know, weddingphotography.com. A subdomain is blog.weddingphotography.com. Right. Or photos.weddingphotography.com. Uh, versus what is technically a subfolder, which would be weddingphotography.com slash blog. Right. That would be a subfolder. Now, in WordPress, when you create a page, it's not actually a subfolder. It's not really creating a subfolder. It's it's dynamic, so it just happens on the you know um, virtually on the fly. Um, even though it's there in the database, it's you're seeing it on the fly. Um, okay. So, um, having it as a subfolder, search engines see it as one website. So anything okay. that does well in the subfolders does well on the main site, and vice versa. So, right. Um, the next thing I want to bring, I want to move into, is uh, your recommended WordPress plugins and/or themes. Now we've brought up Yoast SEO a few times already on the episode, yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm going to include it, of course, because you know you have right. brought it up. But what other um, plugins or themes do you uh, do you use or recommend for photographers to check out? 
So, you know, and I think this is another recurring theme on the show. I, I love uh, Genesis-based themes. <laughs> um, I'm not a theme developer. Design is probably, you know, if we look at, like, major areas of web stuff, design is probably my weakest area. Um, I, you know, I can take a theme and tweak it a little bit, but, you know, CSS and I, we, we do battle. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so... Um, from a theme perspective, from a plugin perspective, one that I think thought would be interesting to mention um, would be, and I know I think it's been mentioned previously. I know you've done some work with it, Scott. Is Optin Monster, yep. which uh, for those who don't know, Optin Monster is a it's a hosted service now, but it has a WordPress plugin that integrates with WordPress, uh, and it's all designed around essentially lead conversion forms, email opt-in forms. Um, pop-ups, inline forms, anything like that. It's a very flexible platform that allows you to create these different opt-in interfaces for your site. Um, email marketing and having an email list, I think, is something that everybody wishes they had started doing sooner. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know anybody who doesn't wish that they'd started an email list sooner. And um, because once you have, you know, social networks come and go, web platforms come and go, but, I mean, email has been there forever. I mean, even, you know, you get a gr group of 100 photographers together, I'll guarantee you there's at least, you know, one or two in there that maybe aren't even on Facebook, which is, you know, the most popular social network. Uh, but I'll guarantee you every single one of them has an email address and they check it every day at least once. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, Optin Monster, um, you can check it out on the web. Um, there's, you know, various versions that do different things for different prices, um, but it, it provides a pretty easy interface for creating, you know, opt-in forms to get people onto an email list, whether you're hosting that list with MailChimp or with, uh, you know, AWeber or any number of different email providers. I recently switched over. I'm using ConvertKit now for, uh, for most I've, of my lists. Um, I've heard but, a lot of good things about that, ConvertKit. Yeah, it's, it's, not necessarily designed for newbies. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, you know, and it's, you know, whereas MailChimp wants to be an email list provider for anybody who needs an email list, ConvertKit really is optimized for professional web publishers. I mean, they talk yeah. about, you know, they're an email provider for bloggers, essentially. So I wouldn't necessarily steer a, a photographer looking to start a list to ConvertKit. Um, I think MailChimp does a great job, especially get they give you, you know, a nice free account up to something like ten or twelve thousand subscribers, yeah. um, and so. Um, but yeah, get that email list set up, uh, and Optin Monster can provide some great ways to help get people onto that list. Whether it's through, um, you know, whether you want to give them a pop up on the website to ask for, you know, their information, or whether you want to write an article and at the bottom of the article have them, you know, hey, click a link to get this, you know, additional report or something, or this checklist, and have it require their email address, uh, any of that Optin Monster can handle. So, um, there's, one, there's one plugin I've been testing, uh, going back to a little bit to where you mentioned Genesis and that you, don't, you and CSS don't like each other <laughs> so much. Um, I've been messing, uh, experimenting, messing with whatever you want to call it, with Design Palette Pro. Have you ever looked at that? I haven't. I saw uh, I saw something from you. I don't remember if it was a tweet or a Facebook post or something mm -hmm. this morning, actually. Yeah, yeah today. <laughs> I saw that, too. Yep. <laughs> Saying that you'd wish you'd looked at it sooner. So now it's oh, going to yeah. be on my list. I need to check it out. So, so um, for anybody who uses the Genesis theme and does not like CSS, check out Design Palette Pro. We'll link to it in the show notes. Um, Is it only for Genesis themes? It's only for Genesis themes. Okay. Um, it works with pretty much every official Genesis theme out of the box. Um, gives you color and spacing, and all the different CSS customizations you'd want to do, but with visual, you know, um, buttons and right. scales and stuff yeah. like that. It also has extensions where you can add custom CSS to the plugin if you want, and things like that. It's, it, I mean, and it has a, a whole UI where you can actually see everything happen in real time before you hit save. Um, it's beautiful. It's not free, but it is beautiful, and we are... Um, <laughs> the best either, things never are. <laughs> yes, um, but it's, it's really it's for anybody who wants to go beyond what the Genesis themes offer built in for customization, um, and we're actually looking into integrating our themes, the Imagely themes, with uh, Design Palette Pro so that we all of our customers will be able to um, use that as well, so... Uh, yes. It's it's a beautiful thing. I mean, once once we got our hands on it, we're like, whoa, why? Really, this has been around? <laughs> right, so yeah, awesome. I mean, 
I know one of the developers behind it and all that, and it's one of those things that's kind of always been on the periphery. I've never really gotten into looking at it, but you know, I'll have yeah. to check that out definitely. Yeah. So awesome. That's awesome. We'll see um, you guys. Cool. So, Aaron, where can we find you on the interwebs? Oh, a couple different places that make sense to photographers. Um, uh, so, photowebo.com, photowebo.com um, is my site where I write about you know all things at the intersection of photography and the internet. Uh, if you want to follow me on social media, I'm a Hockley on Twitter, H O C K L E Y, um, or you can search for me by name on Facebook and find me there. So, great. Awesome. Well, thank um, well, you so much. Yeah, thank you, Aaron, for joining us today. Thank you, Rachel, for being an awesome co-host. And to you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can find the show notes at uh, from today's episode at imagely.com slash podcast slash 14. Yes, until next time. Thanks. Thank you. You've been listening to the WordPress Photography Podcast. To listen to other episodes and to subscribe to the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more, please visit imagely.com forward slash podcast.